Using it, for example, providing the Funnet network between universities and so on. And one of our main tasks is still maintaining the Finnish supercomputers. And work I'm going to present here and things I'm going to present here are mostly related to the uh, use of supercomputers. Python is used at CSC in uh, quite, uh, quite many different various tasks, as I guess in, in many places. So our system administrators naturally use Python for various tasks. We support several Python-based scientific applications. And we do also some software development ourselves. And one of these aspects is software development for massively parallel supercomputers. And I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, what you can do with Python in this, this context. So in the beginning of talk, <coughs> I give you some uh, very general ideas, what we mean by high performance computing, what kind of things we are doing, uh, what are important things. And after that, I will discuss some more, let's say, Python related aspects for high performance. And finally, I discuss some of the challenges we encounter when we try to use Python with uh, thousands of, of processor cores. Uh, during the presentation, if you have some questions, uh, you can you can interrupt me at any point, and I'll, I'll do my best to answer your your questions. I I try to keep things in relatively simple level, not much and difficult technical details. I guess that after lunch, many of you might feel a little bit uh, sleepy, but I will, I will do my best to keep you awake. <coughs> so what we mean by high performance <coughs> computing? I think if you look in Wikipedia, it says something about uh, solving advanced computational problems with use of supercomputers or computer clusters. And Typically, things, things we do with high performance computing, they are related to, to science, some scientific problems, and in most cases, they involve some um, very large scale number crunching. Some might be some partial differential equations, some big matrices we want to multiply and, and manipulate. And things I think most involved is actually related to this number currency. Um, sometimes a little bit difficult to put the distinction which is high performance computing and what's, let's say, normal scientific convertible computing. But some things you can think that, okay, when we are speaking about high performance, we very often talk about uh, very large scale supercomputers computers belonging to the most most latest 500 bit in the world. Uh, also, in high performance computing, we are typically concerned with problems where you can say that uh, more or less every floating point operation that we are doing matters if you are doing some numerical computing. And that means that in most cases, you really try to get as much performance out of the CPUs as possible. There are lots of problems, I'm sure you're aware of, where it doesn't really matter if something you do takes five seconds or 10 seconds or one second or two seconds. That really doesn't make difference. I mean, you get the answer very soon. But in context of high performance computing and scientific computing, it might be that your simulation runs for days, sometimes weeks or months, and here, if you have, a, let's say, factor of two difference in performance, so of course, it's clear that whether you get your results in one week or two weeks, it makes very big difference for the, for the researcher. So what kind of uh, computer systems we are speaking of when speaking about high performance computing? 
Nowadays, the top-end computers, they are able to perform, one, one speaks about petabolic computers, meaning that they can, they can, they can perform something like uh, 10 to the power of 15 voltage point operations per second. And in practice, this is achieved by using, in most cases, commodity processors, but just having tens of thousands of them. And uh, using such large number of uh, processors puts naturally some challenges that, okay, how you actually have to do your programming and so on. If you look at some traditional high performance computing applications and the whole concept, it's most often concerned about the, really the computer or the hardware aspect of the performance. How you can get most out of the hardware. And for that reason, uh, people typically use uh, compiled programming languages, Fortran, in its various incarnations, nowadays mostly Fortran 90, Fortran 95, is still maybe the most widely used programming language for number crunching. C and C++ are taking more space, but I, I know there are still some very old uh, applications written in Fortran 77 that uh, are still existing. And of course, the idea here using these compiled languages is that compilers can do lots of optimization, can get uh, more easier everything out of the, of the CPU. Uh, it should be clear now that uh, with high performance computing, nowadays you almost always want to use several processor cores at the same time, which means that, okay, you have to do some parallel computing. And uh, there are natural different ways of doing parallel computing. The prevailing paradigm in high performance computing at the moment is uh, so-called message passing paradigm. I will go a little bit more, more detail what it actually means in the later part of the presentation. There is also, nowadays, lots of interest to combine uh, some threading with message passing with so-called hybrid programming. But uh, when speaking about really high performance computing, you normally do not rely just on, just on trading. So with trading, you can typically use efficiently maybe four, eight, 16 processor cores, depending on your application and computer hardware. But if you really want to use hundreds or thousands of processors, you have to do something else. There are nowadays some new technologies both in <coughs> hardware and in software, for example, in hardware, uh, general purpose graphical processing units are becoming very popular. And also in there are new programming languages, more designed for parallel computing coming, but I, uh, I don't think they are really used in the, at least these programming languages in real production applications at the moment. <coughs> so while I'd say the traditional approach in high performance computing has been the high performance for the computer. I think it's getting more and more important to also consider the performance for the programmer. And I guess uh, we all here are very familiar with, the, let's say, things that Python can do for enhancing the productivity of the programmer. After all, even power supercomputers are expensive. Even power electricity to run supercomputers is expensive. It's the human time, I mean the labor, which in most cases is really the most expensive factor. And if you can make something to make a programmer more efficient, that can have a also a very big impact in, in for the big picture. So by using Python or one could in principle pick some other high predictive language here. Python is good because of some of the support for let's say numerical computing. I mean we can First of all, we can write the programs in uh, less amount of, of code lines. <coughs> the syntax is typically, I mean, it's very readable. And Python is quite well suited for, let's say, mathemat expressing mathematical equations and so on. The standard library for Python is, is very large, so there are lots of things that are already existing. I mean, one simple example I typically 
so some students coming to Python courses at CSC, if you have, let's say, list of numbers, you want to add something there at certain point in the list and then sort things. With Python, you can do that with two, three lines of program code. If you want to do the same thing with C, you need 30 lines of code or something like that. So codes are easier to maintain and very open by using, let's say, more high-level language like, like Python. Uh, you can concentrate more on the high-level algorithms. And most times, the biggest optimizations you can get to your problem is by uh, optimizing the high-level algorithm. However, still, when you're really doing the high-performance computing, sometimes, let's say, the speed you get with normal Python is, is really not enough, and you need something more. And I'll try to show you some examples that uh, by using uh, some extensions like NumPy, writing part of the code in C yourself, using machine tool libraries, you can actually achieve more or less best of both worlds. The high performance for the programmer by using Python, and also the high performance of the computer. And throughout the lecture, I, I, I try to make some references how we actually do things in practice by using a software package called Gball as a, as a case study. So it's an open source package for quantum mechanical simulations of nanostructures. Some really, really fancy, although let's say, high words there. Um, Interesting things for this audience is that it's implemented largely in Python, some parts in C, and it can run in massively parallel computers. And in massively parallel, we mean here with thousands of CPU cores. It's open source code, and currently there are some 20, 30 people, I think around 30 people have uh, at the moment uh, uh, commit rights to the, to the person control repository spread in Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Germany, UK, and US. Um, here is some um, more, let's say, scientific article about the properties of the, uh, or let's say, the physics and so behind the code. And this is the main, main web page where you can download and have all the documentation and get more, more information. So let's discuss first some, let's say, good things about using using Python in this kind of uh, application. Uh, if you consider typical uh, high-performance <coughs> computing applications, there are actually very, very many things which are not really related to the high-performance. Reading input, writing output, setting up, let's say, uh, supporting data structures and so on, they in most cases actually consume a large part of the program lines and so on. Maybe not so much of CPU time. And uh, while using Python, I mean, you have all the convenient built-in data structures, lists and dictionaries, which you, which you can use nicely for this kind of uh, non-performance critical medical data. File and text manipulations, if you compare what you can do with Python, what you can do with Fortran or C, I mean, there is huge difference. Um, dynamic typing is something I found very convenient, at least with this application. For example, depending on a little bit what kind of calculation you do, we might be dealing with uh, real numbers or complex numbers. With C and Fortran, that means that, okay, we should write different functions both for real and uh, complex numbers. Of course, you can use some preprocessor microprocessors and so on. But in Python, I mean, then typing, you just have the same function. And now, depending on your actual input, for example, these arrays can be either real and complex, and everything, everything works perfectly. You have the, let's say, full object oriented nature of Python. In C or C++, you can, of course, do object orientation. In Fortran, it's more difficult. But with Python, you have all these 
all this, let's say, uh, power available. <coughs> when thinking about uh, lambda crunching aspect, it's uh, probably clear to most of you that, I mean, lists are very flexible, but they are not really suitable for numerical computation. So I mean, this flexibility uh, comes with a price in terms of uh, computer efficiency, and therefore something something else is needed. How many are familiar with NumPy? Okay, most of you actually. So you know that NumPy is sort of third-party extension package for Python, and I think the most important aspect, <coughs> at least for us, is this new array data type. So we have the multidimensional array, which is no longer dynamic, as, as the list, it's a static. And I mean, with list, you can of course construct the sort of lists of list of list to create multidimensional data structures, but they are not really multidimensional in the sense that you could do slicing over arbitrary axis and so on. Uh, with NumPy, you have you have that in your in disposal. Uh, there are also some utilities for, let's say, fast processing of arrays. And NumPy also contains some linear algebra random number function. Whereas this uh, linear algebra that uh, NumPy provides is maybe not so important. Um, when you're dealing with NumPy arrays, I mean, you can have a normal uh, addition, uh, subtraction, multiplication, division and so on, operations, which are done element-wise. And uh, when you're dealing with full NumPy arrays, it means that the loops, they actually get it in C level. So NumPy is written in C, and when you're calling some NumPy functions, you're actually going to some C function where, where the execution can be, can be very fast. Uh, this also means that if you want to get good performance out of, out of NumPy, you should avoid any, any for loops. Uh, there is not MATLAB, so you should try to write your operations in sort of vectorizable operations, so dealing with full arrays at the point. For certain mathematical operations, uh, NumPy has also special functions, so they can deal with the whole arrays at the point, for example, trigonometric functions, exponential, and so on. The performance you get from NumPy is not quite that of the C, but it starts to be, and actually depends on the case, but it starts to be much, much closer to C than, than pure Python. Uh, NumPy has seven routines for basic linear algebra, uh, matrix vector operations, matrix matrix operations, and in principle, it's always possible to build NumPy in such a way that it's actually linked to the very high performance numerical libraries, which are typically really tuned for the underlying hardware. Uh, I don't know how many of you familiar with this basic linear algebra subroutine library class. Uh, Atlas is uh, one implementation which you can typically get to every, every computer. And most of the computers, they actually sit their own version of Plus. And important thing is here that uh, when you're now using a NumPy, so that it's built with these uh, uh, very highly tuned libraries, and let's say you want to do matrix multiplication. So A, B, and C here, they are their matrices. They actually quite small, dimension here is only 200. If you try to do that in simple way, based Python using for loops, takes uh, about five seconds. If you do naive implementation in C, also just with uh, basically three loops, you get something like uh, 0 0.09 seconds. This is of course not the way how you're supposed to do it in C, but uh, if you do it naively. And if you now try to use NumPy with this machine tool library, you can see that you can create and beat this naive C implementation by, by factor of there. Yes. To verify, is it matrix or array? Uh, array multiplication. It's a two-dimensional matrix, so 200 by 200 matrix. So it's, it's so a matrix multiplication. Yeah, because if, if you write like, like this, 
in, in uh, NumPy. Of course, in NumPy, right. yeah, that's uh, that's just element-wise multiplication. Yeah. So mathematical operations of matrix matrix multiplication. And maybe the, let's say yes. Uh, I would guess that MATLAB also will, will be linked against there is some machine tooth libraries. So I would think that with MATLAB you get something very similar here. And of course, if you are, let's say, a clever HPC programmer, you are not doing this naive C, but actually from your C code, you are calling the same library and you get the same result. That's at least what you should do. And I think. Uh, in terms of performance, I, I don't have that extensive uh, experience with MATLAB. But I would guess that in most cases, performance difference between MATLAB and NumPy is not that great. What is the biggest difference is that MATLAB is first of all bureaucratic software. You have to pay for every license. Second, with MATLAB, you get very specific MATLAB programming language, which is nice for certain things, while with Python you get this general fully object-oriented programming languages. I think the important lesson is here that uh, it doesn't actually apply just if you use Python for doing high performance computing. Even if you are using Fortran C, if there exists a machine tooth library for the task you are doing, you should always try to actually link to that. And when most of your heavy stuff is doing done in libraries, it doesn't actually matter what you're using, which language you're using as a glue language. When everything is going in libraries, you get the typical highest performance. Cheaper code actually doesn't really use NumPy's uh, own that function for performance critical things. One reason is that in some supercomputing systems, uh, building NumPy with this uh, Atlas support is it's not sometimes uh, can be non-trivial, so we actually use a custom interface to the uh, plus plus G code. Even though with NumPy, yes. Uh, so why is it a custom interface? I'm sorry. Uh, well, I would say custom just in the because uh, did you make like some uh, performance modifications, or is it custom in the sense that you can call? Uh, it's just from a kind Python. of custom wrapper. So uh, there okay. are, let's say, you pass NumPy array to our own code, and then within this code you actually call this library. So ah, it's okay. So you just that's, have that's wrap. Uh, okay. on only the is custom, so it's a specific to the program. But we will just call the uh, routines in this, let's say, the standard routine. Uh, while with NumPy, you can in many cases, uh, I would say, get, get all in the regime there. It starts to be that how much optimizations uh, benefit you. I mean, there is always some, some step where you can only improve <coughs> performance by a small amount, and that requires very lots of work. And whether that pays off or not, it's, uh, it's not always clear. But if there are situations where, let's say, the performance you can get with NumPy is not enough, you there are some, let's say, further things you can do. And what is done with the uh, GPO is that uh, we build some of our own C extensions to the Python. How many of you have been done doing any Python C extensions yourself? Few of you, okay. Uh, point is, of course, that uh, if you know how to code and uh, it's would see it or Fortran, it's typically much easier to get high performance out of the CPU. And compilers are typically very good in optimizing the code. Problem is, of course, that uh, it can take some time to uh, optimize the code and so on. The good thing is that if you look at typical applications, it's only very small, small versions of the code that really takes some time. I think there is some 90, 10 rule or something like that, meaning that in most cases, 90% uh, of your computing time is spent in 10% of code. So you could think that, okay, you can use 
for 90% of things you can use Python and NumPy, and just for 10% you can use C. Meaning that uh, if you just optimize this part, you are already getting pretty much as good performance as, as possible from, let's say, algorithmic and hardware point of view. Uh, writing C extensions, it's actually it's uh, relatively straightforward, at least when you're done it first time. Uh, there are some setting up and so on, which looks a little bit complicated at first, but there are some copy paste and so on. Once you have created your first C extensions, there is this relatively straightforward. Uh, we actually use C extensions also, as, as mentioned, to interface some of these uh, optimized libraries. And I would say that the main function of NumPy, actually, from performance point of view, is that they, they act as very convenient data containers. They are static. Uh, the array data, you can construct and it's contiguous in memory, so you can easily access that from your C code. So typically, uh, Things we have to do in the code are finite different derivatives <coughs> over three dimensional arrays. That means that you have to loop over the array and then you calculate some differences between neighboring elements in x, y, and z directions. So we can pass the full 3D array, NumPy array, to our C extension. <coughs> and after, let's say, 10 lines of C code, we have pointer to the actual data and we can have uh, our loops, loops over over the array and do the manipulations and that's it. So it's, uh, at the end it's, uh, uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, there are some tools that can actually simplify the interfacing. Uh, I haven't actually used them, there is something called Stitch, Cyton, Pyrex, they are all things that you are supposed to help you write, let's say, more Python-like code. <coughs> code, but uh, we haven't actually used it. We have, we have basically used, uh, let's say, QC approach. Partly, I think that this is in this historical. I think the code project was started in 2002, 2003. I, I was involved around 2005. And I think when the project was started, this, let's say, additional tools were not so major. Uh, and it was sort of easier decision to start work with your own custom, custom C interfaces. And of course, when you have uh, some of this done, it's, uh, 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 it's not so big deal, let's say, to go a little bit further off there. The sort of, you can summarize the whole <coughs> implementation idea in, in G4 with Python and C is that uh, uh, in Python you can do let's say fast development you can construct all your high level algorithms in Python and by tuning some very specific parts actually all the operations you are doing in your high level algorithm might be executed in C or in library so they, they will be executed fast and you can just modify the high level Python code to alter the algorithm. And in my opinion, that has worked really well. It's much easier to think a little bit new algorithm when you have some basic operations which uh, repeat in, in all algorithms in the C. Uh, and uh, when you have, let's say, these main numerical kernels <coughs> in the C, you can really end up in a situation that I would say in typical case when you when you run simulation with cheap of I would say five percent of the time is spent in Python parts and ninety-five percent in the C part on the libraries. So this five percent is let's say some some penalty you always have to pay if you want to use Python as, as you mentioned <coughs> here. But on the other hand the, let's say the benefits in the developing new things, uh, maintaining code and so on, probably outweigh this five percent penalty. Yes. Have you tried say uh, PyPy to uh, make the uh, Python code faster? Uh, no. One problem is of course that we really rely heavily on NumPy. 
And at the moment, uh, I think you can at least buy by the I, I know there is a development going on. Also, we have this uh, amount of our own C extensions. I think also at the moment you cannot uh, combine PyPy with your own C extensions. So at the moment it's it's not really option, but it's, it's something which is interesting. I mean, at the moment we are using just the standard C Python, okay. which has its own own problems uh, as we discuss in a moment. Here you can see some development of the of the code base, the code. And one thing you can probably easy, easy notice that the amount of C code, I mean, it has increased only a little bit here, really started to settle down here, and number of Python code. So once you have the, let's say, basic numerical kernels implemented here in C, most, let's say, adding new features and so on to the code, you can actually do just by coding in Python. So you can get these new features much faster. <coughs> you can also see that uh, there is some documentation has started to do that there. What, what happened in, in July 08 with the documentation? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I think uh, what, uh, what happened is that I think the documentation that is counted here is the amount of uh, documentation in the wiki, number of lines in uh, uh, RST files. And before that documentation was in a little bit different format, so it didn't actually show up in this count. So it, it really didn't jump from, from nowhere to up something. Yes? Uh, is there an actual downward trend uh, in the lines of C code? I don't know how big the trend is. I, I don't think. <coughs> There has been some new additions to the C code. It might be that some of these downgrade is also that there has been, let's say, uh, old code, which is not used anymore, which got deleted at some point. One of the things that, uh, at least at some point, we still had to work with computers <coughs> where the C compiler did not support the C99 standard. Uh, we didn't have complex numbers here, so we had to have some, let's say, different code paths and a little bit different code for cases where whether we have a C99 standard or not. And I think uh, something like this might have happened here, so these old parts can get deleted. But I would say the amount of functionality in C code hasn't really decreased. It has stayed uh, relatively constant, some, some small addition throughout the years. Okay, so this is basically how you how can try to get uh, lots of performance out of your serial application. So first you write everything in Python, or if you already know your algorithm well, you know where the time is going to be spent. Uh, you can try to do some, uh, or let's say you start with Python and NumPy, and you might start some profiling and some critical parts internet in C or maybe try Cypher or some of these other tools. So of course, uh, when we're talking about high performance computing, we are not so much interested how much performance you can get out of serial applications, but file applications. So let's look a little bit uh, how you can do, or <coughs> how we are doing the parallelization aspect here. So as mentioned, the uh, prevailing standard or paradigm when you do really this massive parallel computing is the message passing. And idea here is that uh, if you launch in identical processes, all these processes contain exactly the same program code. And these processes, they have something called rank, which you can identify that they run the first or second or last or so on process. All these processes have a local memory, so they cannot really access the memory of other processes directly. But what you can do, you can exchange messages between, between processes. So let's say here we would have one process, put some data, A and B. Here are the process. 
with different A and B, and now if they need to change some information, uh, they will send and receive messages. And this kind of uh, paradigm is described in a standard called message passing interface or MPI, which is called the standard uh, application program interface and also library for this kind of message passing applications. <coughs> MPI standard defines interfaces for Fortran, C, in principle also to C++, but that actually deprecated at the moment. There are some analytical bindings for MPI. Some of you are familiar with the MPI for PY. Okay, in any case, it's just a, a Python extension module you can use for doing parallel or basic passing program in top of Python. How we actually doing things with GPO when when you talk about message passing with Python, what's, what's typically going on? It typically means that you actually launch uh, amount of independent Python interpreters. So if you're running with the end processor cores, with end processes, we launch also the same amount of Python interpreters. And now these different Python interpreters, these Python processes, they can use MPI to exchange data. Uh, as I mentioned, nowadays there is this uh, actually quite nice package MPI for PY for using Python in message passing. At the point when the code was started, this was not existing. So sort of custom interface with, let's say, subset of MPI package we need was created. And uh, with this custom interface, we can actually have these uh, message passing commands both in our high-level code in Python and both in low-level code in C. So this is some uh, code snippet from the code. This is actually a function which is implemented in C. So when you call this, everything goes to our C extension. And within the C extension, we make some calls to the message passing library. Once we return there, we, one thing we might want to do is uh, some this array, which has now been distributed to all processes, uh, make some summation over all these elements. So there are functions in MPI for doing this so-called MPI reduce. And for this summation, we have here our known, let's say, function, so we can do this MPI part in Python here. Uh, Using Python for this kind of parallel programming has, let's say, the benefits that, okay, syntax might be a little bit simple, you can use some object oriented features, but there are lots of concerns when doing parallel programming about synchronization, load balance, and so on. And all things, I mean, you still have to care about. So Python doesn't give you any, any kind of uh, uh, escape from these concerns here. So when you do this parallelization, how things work? <coughs> Here are some data for actual simulation runs uh, in two little bit different computational modes. So the first one has been carried on in <coughs> IBM Blue Chip B machine at the National Laboratory at, at the United States. And the kind of ideal speed up here means that if you double the number of processor cores or processing elements, you have the execution time. And that's, of course, the sort of idea you can get out. With blue line, you can get pretty much the, let's say, the real speed ups we are getting there. And let's say, in, for example, in CSC standards, we consider that the application has good parallel scalability if you get the improvement of uh, 1.5, 1.6 when you double the number of processing cores. And this blue line is clearly through these limits. In a different combinational mode, this has been now carried on in different computer, Cray XT5 in Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the United States, uh, where it's good scalability up to 
25,000 protester cores. And I'm quite confident that they would have continued this year uh, up to 100,000 processor cores. We would still have got good pile of scale up it. Um, okay, we can get the good parallel scalability. We can get the good performance. So I think we did some performance measurements on CSC's create pipe machine. And let's say with uh, 2,000 processor cores, if we measure the number of floating point operations we actually perform, that was something 25% of the total <coughs> maximum. And if you have done some, let's say, performance tuning yourself, you probably know that I would say if you get 10 or 15% of theoretical peak performance of uh, floating point operation performance by how you write yourself, you are already doing quite a good job. The last fraction here comes mainly from the fact that with this large scale calculation, uh, large fraction of time is spent in matrix matrix multiplications. And matching tuned matrix matrix uh, libraries, they can actually eat something like 90% uh, of, of the oracle peak performance. But that, of course, means that there are lots of assembly, and I don't know, for matrix matrix multiplications, you probably have uh, hundreds of lines of code with really, really highly tuned. Something you don't want to do yourself. Uh, however, I mean, before you can actually reach this performance, there are a few challenges you have to overcome. Some of things are probably sort of obvious, some are maybe not so obvious. Sort of minor concerns is that, uh, I mean, as long as you work with standard Linux or so, uh, having Python, making your C extensions and so on, it's, uh, it's a relatively straightforward. But when you go to these really big supercomputers, they might have some special operating systems, like red kernels or so. And at some point, the issue we really have to fight is, is that at some point we can create within support dynamic linking. And if you have any clue about, let's say, how Python works with importing and so on, you know that it really relies on dynamic linking. I mean, your extension modules, the dynamic libraries, large part of the standard library is uh, uh, shared libraries, dynamic modules. NumPy comes mainly as uh, dynamic, dynamic library. So we actually had to do some small tuning of the, of the Python code itself to get its support or to enable static linking fully. I think at the moment we are not using any computers without support for dynamic uh, linking. And uh, dynamic linking might have some performance aspects when running with uh, thousands of processors, but uh, that's not that big concern anymore. Uh, so the bigger concern in development point of view is that uh, <coughs> in order to have your application behave correctly. I, I doubt that no one us here is able to write battery code. Is someone? Oh, <laughs> good, but I will hire you. <laughs> and I mean, because we make bugs, we need also debuggers. Python comes with a relatively decent command line debugger, which you can also use from graphical user interfaces. But I mean, that works on for serial cases. If you have to do parallel debugging, and that's naturally something you, I mean, if you go to run with large number of processes, processor cores, you also need to debug your parallel application. And there are tools for that, but they are both traditional, um, let's say, high performance computing applications, which mean that typically they support only Fortran and C. You can use these tools in sometimes to, let's say, debug your uh, C parts of your code. But for Python parts, sometimes you adjust what you can do as some print statements or some stupid thing. So they are not really, I'm not aware of any parallel 
Python debug at the moment. Also, when you get the, let's say, battery code, you actually get the good performance, uh, both for serial and for parallel case. Typically, you really need to do some profiling and optimization, for example, how to send the messages and things like that. And then you also need some tools. And also this parallel, I mean, Python comes with, uh, I think, a little nice uh, C profile module you can use for uh, simple cases. But once again, when you want to profile something running on 1000 CPUs, you need really specific tool for that. And also most of these tools support only C and Fortran. You can see the, let's say, time spent in your C extensions, but for the, let's say, all the Python parts, you have just some large black region that, okay, time steps under. There is one um, parallel profiling uh, software at the moment I'm aware of called Cloud, which actually supports Python. I mean that's something you can you can you can really live on relatively easily. What is maybe the or was the more major challenge and something we actually still a little bit working on is that uh, and you don't actually think in the beginning is the Python's import mechanism. Uh, how many of you are familiar what happens when you say import something? Python, really? Okay. So what it happens, it actually generates a lot of small file I.O. Meaning lots of uh, opening file, uh, calling stat system call to see, for example, that the directory exists, what's the modification time of file, and so on. And um, if you look, uh, let's say, in detail what's going on, if you try to say import foo, what happens? First, you check that whether there is directory called foo. If it exists, it says that, okay, that's made package, whether there is a dash dash init, init there. If not, okay, try to loop if there is a foo.so, foo.module.so, finally foo.py and foo.pyc. And it does this for first in a working directory, then in some system default directories. And if you have set the Python path in Python path to yourself, also all the directories put in this path. Which means that actually there might be really lots of F open stat syscalls when you just say your first import statement in your top level script. I mean that probably triggers lots of imports in other modules. And if you think about cheap um, I think the the input file actually we use it, it's a Python script, sometimes quite convenient. And there is one import statement you always have to do. And after that triggers lots of other imports, meaning that uh, there is some 350 modules imported same time. And if you count all these system calls, there are almost uh, three and a half thousand of them. When you're doing things in zero, it's uh, not that bad. I would say that in my desktop it takes maybe from three to five seconds. Something you can live very easily. Now you maybe maybe can imagine what happens when ten thousand processors all try to do the same system calls for the same files at the same time. Most parallel file systems, especially, they are designed for accessing large files in parallel and not for these kind of small file things. Things where you have lots of this metadata file modification time, whether it exists or not. And uh, when you try to do that with large number of processes, let's say we are using 32,000 processor cores in the and Blue GP. Any guess is how long it takes to say single import statement with, okay, 10 figures of the others. One minute, ten minutes. I think it was something like forty-five minutes. So for forty-five minutes, before no computation has started, forty-five minutes just to finish the first import before you can start to do anything. Thirty-two thousand processor cores doing nothing 
but trying to read small files from the file system. I think that starts to be quite a waste of resources. So <coughs> one sort of uh, hacker team we have been doing, doing lately, trying to circumvent this problem, is that uh, of course, to, let's say, clean idea is that uh, you look the, let's say, source code of uh, C Python, see where the import goes on, and okay, yeah, now let's say one process reads the bytecode or so on and sends it to other processes. But the actual C code is, yes? I think you're not manually importing this, uh, like, underscore, underscore import and, like, direct file. You can make your own hook. Problem is that actually there are lots of imports going on when you, let's say, just launch the interpreter without any explicit import statements in, the, in your own Python code. And many of them already, I mean, you, you get quite a lot of these. And these you cannot circumvent just by, let's say, having your own import hooks. Something we have talked a little bit uh, from more, let's say, more practical point of view, there are some things related to NPI and so on, which means that we actually sort of build our own Python interpreter, and we have to initialize also the NumPy library before we are executing any part of the, let's say, actual Python source. So I, we haven't been able to figure out any ways to uh, really modify the import hooks early enough without going to the Python source. Yes? Uh, would it be possible to have a single Python process that imports all the stuff and then you fork uh, the handler processes from that after it has imported? In principle, yes. It's just that, let's say, if you're using this API message passing thing, the sort of execution model there doesn't really support that, at least in, in most cases. So in NPI, you typically, I mean, you have some special launch command to call the NPI run, and you say NPI run some executable, and this NPI run does actually the forking. So doing this kind of thing might might require to modify also this, let's say, NPI start mechanism. One solution which worked well, quite OK in, in blue gene is at some point that actually you put this uh, your own Python modules to RAM disk and they actually read them from memory and not from the disk and sped up things. But for example, Craig cannot have RAM disks. So we had to really do some some hacking. It was actually interesting. We found one paper from 92-93 where they already introduced the idea that uh, you, what we do, you make some sort of uh, specific wrappers for C stand I/O functions. So every time you call f open within the let's say Python's import mechanism, you actually call your own wrapper. And what happens with this wrapper is that there only one process, okay, opens the file. Um, and sort of then sends the information to the other processes. When you want to read something from the file, once again, all one process does the reading and then uses the MPI for transferring data to the other processes. Uh, at the moment, it actually seems to work quite nicely. So this data is now from the Ukraine oh, machine. So with 4,000 processes, it took about 600 seconds, 10 minutes to do this import with this modification hack to the C Python in big picture, okay, smallest constant. And here we can see that it's around 10, 12 seconds. And that's naturally something, I mean, if you're running for a few hours, it really doesn't matter anything. We at the moment testing the thing in larger scale. See that, I mean, if you're running with uh, uh, 6,000 processor cores, how much, let's say, more it costs there. But it seems that, uh, I mean, I would say that we can spend two, three minutes maybe there. That's not a big problem. But 45 minutes, that's, that's way too much. 
Uh, one more challenge, which is maybe classically not so acute, and I'm, I'm not stating so much, uh, I think I'm running out of time here, is that if you want to use trading to get your message passing, is of course the infamous global integrated lock. We can still use a stretch within our own C extension, regardless whether this log exists or not. But that might mean that, uh, in our different point of view, we, we could use, let's say, much more close grained parallelism than this uh, infregular allows us. Uh, however, the <coughs> code at the moment, it's basically uses only this message passing, and trading plus message passing is something we are only experimenting at the moment. OK, I think it's uh, time to wrap everything up and put together. I discussed some, some ways you can think of uh, doing if you want to use Python for getting really everything out of your computing hardware. Depending on the problem you are actually, actually wanting to solve, whether this is needed or not, it, it, it's of course depends, depends on the application. But uh, some sort of message here is that by using Python, you can really get all these productivity enhancing features we all love with Python while writing only small part of code in C using NumPy and so on you will also get the very good performance and at least we have now uh, some example that uh, despite of the challenges that massive supercomputers together with Python might introduce we actually can get quite good performance with quite large number of processor cores. And finally, just want to acknowledge some of the funders of this code development and some people in the chief of development team. And finally, I want to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer you. Yeah. Yeah. You obviously have the message passing architecture, which is really nice for parallel. And also for distribution, so could you comment on the distribution of the, let's say, execution and kind of the whole thing? Does it scale in the distribution? Well, you, what we are sort of. Uh, could you repeat the question from yeah, the microphone? Sure. So the question was about, can I comment generally about, I think, distributing the whole computation and how we are doing that. So what we are doing is, I mean, typical when speaking about parallel computing, there are two obvious ways. You can have a different tasks, which you can execute at the same time, or you can sort of divide your data and process these sort of independent. And uh, let's say main kind of quantity data we, we want to process here is, if you know anything about quantum mechanics, is the wave functions. You can think it's a four-dimensional array. So we have some um, amount of electrons in large-scale calculations that might be 2,000. And then we have some numerical grid on real space in x, y, and z dimensions, give us three dimensions. So we have a four-dimensional data structure for array. And now for parallel. <coughs> Uh, what we do, we really distribute this four-dimensional array, and we can distribute it in all four dimensions to different processors. And depending on the part of the algorithm, you you of course need information in some part of the array, in also let's say then processing others. But the algorithm at the moment is such that you always, in most cases, you need only data from nearest neighbors. So let's say even though you might have been running with uh, 10,000 of processors, a single process needs some amount of data only for, let's say, small amount of processes and not from from all processes you need only when you do some sort of global summation so the other is and these are pure relatively rarely. Okay, uh, we're running out of time, so thank you for your presentation.